Hi, Carolyn. My name is Patricia Rabbits, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the chair of CAMP's annual conference 2018. I specialize in the treatment of eating disorders in my practice in Marin County, and I am thrilled to have this opportunity to learn more about your work in the field of eating disorder treatment and about your personal journey. Um, you are clearly a recognized pioneer in the field of eating disorder treatment, and I'm interested in hearing your views on the evolution of treatment. Um, as you know, we've seen treatment move from the idea of controlling the substance with abstinence from certain foods that were identified as addictive, such as in 12-step programs like Overeaters Anonymous and Food Addicts Anonymous. And now we've evolved to where we're seeing uh, the recognition by many clinicians that eating disorders are based in early childhood trauma as highlighted by the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, otherwise known as ACE, um, that was done at UC San Diego um, and with the Kaiser Foundation. So if I may, I'd like to begin by hearing about your personal struggle with anorexia and how that led you into the eating disorder treatment field. Okay, well, well, thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for being the, the conduit to get me to speak for CAMPT. Um, it was probably somewhat like 20 some, 18 some years ago, the last time I ever spoke for CAMPT. So I'm so uh, happy to be back. Thank you so much. Um, well, just a little bit about my illness. You know, it, it was at a time when um, anorexia was not a common household wor word. So it really took a while to even um, figure out what was going on with me, what was wrong with me. And eventually a physician said, um, oh, I think you have this thing that I read about in this book. And it was, and it was actually a book by Hilda Bruch, who probably, as you know, wrote The Golden Cage, one of the first books on anorexia. This was not The Golden Cage. It hadn't even been published yet. This was a book she wrote on um, obesity and the eating disorders. And there was like two thirds about obesity. And the very back of the book was about these girls, these um, girls who were fasting and girls who she ended up calling uh, anorexia. So it, it took a while to get uh, any kind of diagnosis. And then of course, from that, there was no one who knew what to do to treat it. So I'm fortunate that the kind of people I was surrounded with, the kinds of things I was interested in, um, I mean, eventually I recovered from that illness, from, from anorexia nervosa. And so when I became a therapist, I, this is in that, so that was in the, late 60s, early 70s. When I became a therapist in 1979, which I know sounds like, it just sounds like forever ago, um, I didn't expect to be an eating disorder therapist because I thought, well, how many girls with anorexia and bulimia? You can't make a practice out of that. Um, but what, what happened was um, I started getting some referrals uh, from people who said, oh, this girl has that thing you had. And so I, I ultimately what happened is I kind of made a name for myself when I had a, a private practice in Simi Valley, California. Um, and then more and more people started coming in. And what happened really was I treated them like I recovered from this, so can you. And I didn't even look back. I didn't think this is a difficult illness to treat. I didn't think there's a lot of resistance. And I didn't even, and I think that was really a part of my success and continues to be in this field that I don't, I, I know what the data, I know what the statistics are, but I also know what my statistics were. And, and, and it's weird because I don't mean to be a braggart or anything, but I, I think they're complicated illnesses. Um, but I think that because I had an, a certain understanding and knew how to avoid power struggles, I don't know. I just think that has helped contribute to my, my success. And, and what you mentioned, the, I, never, um, I never considered it an addiction. Let's go to how the field progressed. People would come into my office and they would say, oh, I went to this meeting and I was told um, to admit I'm powerless over food. And I would scratch my head and I would say, 
well, I'm trying to teach you you're powerful, way more powerful than food. So help me understand that. So I started reading about AA and OA and, um, and, and realized that OA just sort of adopted the AA tenants. Um, and it made a little more sense than using it for anorexia and bulimia. With, with people who binge eat, it made a little more sense that, oh, you're addicted to these foods and you have to not eat these foods. But then they made this uh, broad leap into anorexia and bulimia. And that made individuals like myself and some others to start looking at it like, does this really make sense when we're talking about food? Thank you. And I just want to acknowledge that the, the perspective that you brought into treatment, that th this is something you heal from and that, you know, I think that is so powerful. And I, I know when I, when I say that to patients, they're often, they're just so relieved to hear that it's not this, this idea that this is something you will always have and that you'll battle it every day, that you, that you really can get back to a normal, whatever that means, relationship with food. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, well, true, normal relationship with food in this culture is, is kind of wacky. We, everybody comes to their personal relationship with food that they can live with that's not destructive and, and all that. But it still amazes me. Uh, I was in a battle in the last few days on the internet, again, over this topic of recovered. And I am amazed that I probably stood up at the first, the first time I stood up at an international conference and said, I'm recovered. And I had a few other recovered people there with me, people who I had treated who were also recovered, who had been recovered for years, you know, seven years, five years. Me at that time, I don't know how many years. I was probably 10 years in or something. But anyway, this was about... 28 years ago or something like that. And what really astonished me is how many people came up to me and said, oh, I'm treating eating disorders, but I've never heard that you can be recovered and I've never met anyone who was recovered. And I thought, imagine treating cancer or depression or, or anything mm -hmm. and never having seen someone who was recovered. And I thought, I, I've got to really speak out. I have to go to more conferences. I have to teach that this can really be something that you get over. And I'm still fighting that. I used to fight it with the 12-step group. And now, as you talk about the evolution of our field, in the 80s, the whole genetics thing, came, yes. well, it started probably in the late 80s, but really only it was only really in the, I shouldn't say 80s, more in the 90s and the early 2000s, all the genetic studies. And, and, and there are some genetic predispositions for eating disorders, but that the sound bites that the media gets and the population gets from those kind of studies are that eating disorders are genetic. So now it's a whole other battle to fight because clients, as you said, um, Back then, our clients or our patients, you know, I use the words interchangeably because people are comfortable with different ones, but would come into our offices and back then they would say, oh, I always have to deal with this and manage this for the rest of my life. I'm always going to be recovering, never recovered. And I would say that that's not true. And I think give them hope. Now about the genetic thing, the new version of that is individuals coming into my office and say, oh, I heard it's in my genes. So why bother? We have a tendency to be reductionistic like that and to not, not really look at the values that those things can provide. For example, the 12-step group, it's beautiful that there's a community, that there's people who um, been there, done that, you know, they, the sponsors that give back, um, having round-the-clock support you can call in the middle of the night. Um, there's a bunch of positive things about it, but to just pick up this illness and put it in there like it would fit. It, it's, it doesn't make any sense. And the same thing for genetics. Mm -hmm. I, I understand the genetic predisposition for anorexia nervosa. For example, the perfectionism, the anxiety. There, there are traits that you see in individuals. But what I tell, teach those individuals is you're going to have those traits. It's how you channel those traits. If you channel your perfectionism into counting calories, that's going to be bad. 
but but it, I always make a joke like I love to um, hire hire people who had anorexia nervosa in the past because they get their paperwork done on time. You know, I do. So yes. teaching people that this is yes, you have the genes. Just because you have a genetic predisposition, that doesn't equal the illness. We can't give anybody a test nowadays and predict they're going to get anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa or binge eating because they have a certain genetic predisposition. All we can say is this is correlated. It's not, it's not causal, you know? Exactly. And in some of the other interviews I've done with our um, speakers that are going to be at our conference, they have spoken... Uh, to this point as well. Um, Adi Jaffe, who's in Los Angeles, was talking about his experience of it being almost sacrilege in a 12-step program to say, I'm recovered. And oh, that he, yeah. Right? Yeah. You're just, like, you're right. going up against the whole program. Right. And the shaming quality of the anonymity of those programs. And I think with eating disorders, you know, it's, it's um, except for bulimia, where I think that sometimes you know, people in, um, you know, in the circle of friends and in family may not really have any idea that this person is purging or, or doing right. other, to keep their right. weight down. Um, but when you have binge eating disorder or anorexia, you know, it's, it's more obvious. And I think that, you know, speaking to this other question of genetics or brain chemistry um, in our conference, because the, the focus of the whole conference is addiction. Um, I, I hope that you're able to catch some of the other talks. We have Gabor Mate, who's going to be there with um, Vincent Folletti talking about the connection with the early environment. So, so rather, as you're saying, than it being causal, that it's really that, you know, you're, you're not getting the support you need or you're having trauma that isn't dealt with. And so you turn to certain behaviors or substances to help you manage anxiety and depression. That's right. I was just talking yesterday. I'm on a new project on, on anxiety. I'll, I'll tell you about maybe at the conference. Won't take up the time now, but um, I was talking about how so many young kids have anxiety. And you know, anxiety is a huge component of eating disorders. Yes. I had to add the um, anxiety inventory to my um, intake yeah. because everyone was coming through with anxiety. So that was a part of, I assume that became a part of the, of the intake process I always did in my private practice and at Montanito. And there's something like 80% of people with anorexia and bulimia, at least, that get diagnosed with anxiety disorder at some point in their lifetime. And you're right. The, that's what turns people to deal with those kinds of feelings. That's what turns them to drugs and alcohol and self-harming and all, suicide and all these things that we start treating those things and and forget this underlying root part you know exactly that's why, that's why you can easily look at and, and it helps parents i think to see your eating disorder um was not the problem it was your solution to the problem but so well stated and something that i i often um will will say in you know in the treatment room is that um if you have the support and the understanding and the empathy from a person in your life, really turning to a substance would be such a, a like sad substitute because you could get it really from a human, which is really what we're all seeking. But when you don't have that and your, your environment isn't providing that, that it's a survival mechanism to turn to a substance or a behavior that calms you or also helps kind of push you out of your depression so you can function in the world. Well, you will love, you don't know about this yet, but you will love a new book that's coming out that I just participated in. I wrote the chapter on um, therapeutic presence in terms of healing trauma. And I didn't want to talk about evidence-based. I didn't want to talk about all the trauma theories and stuff. The, the book is, has a lot of different authors. My focus was, what does your presence in the room with this person, how does that facilitate healing? And the thing is, when we used to talk about it as a, you know, it can be touchy-feely, or we can back it up with attachment theory. We can back it up with polyvagal theory about how 
a human being in terms of the proximity of where you sit, your soothing voice, your eye contact or not, how that helps calms people, lower, lowers people's cortisol levels, you know, calms their amygdala, all these things that there is science to back this, this stuff up. That's why my talk that I'm giving for this conference sounds really woo-woo, don't you think? I mean, it sounds, and you're the one who got it accepted. <laughs> I did, I did. I don't know how you did that, but it's making me a little nervous because I was looking at my handout and I thought, the only other time I gave this talk, I gave it to a group of people who had heard me speak a bunch of times. So I just went for it. So now I'm looking at rearranging it so I don't start off talking about atoms, I mean, and quantum theory. But, but the reality is neuroscience and, and, and ancient texts like Buddhism actually have a lot in common. And, and quantum physics actually has a lot. When you, when, you, when you look at things on a quantum level, there are things that we realize about the nature of reality and about just this simple fact, energy follows thought, and what we pay attention to and how we pay attention shapes the course of our life and our happiness. And you can find that all over quantum physics, you know? So I'm a neophyte in quantum physics, but I like to always teach what I'm learning because that's what I'm most excited about, you know? Yes. Well, I'm really excited. I can't wait to hear your talk. And because I tend to read about quantum physics and I use uh, even some of the examples that, you know, that you mentioned in treatment um, because I think they're really effective. So to have you do a talk where you're tying all of that together, I'm really excited about. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about your talk, but I just wanted to see before we do that, if there was anything else you wanted to share about your evolution as a professional treating eating disorders? Have you, have you noticed like a shift in your own approach? Well, okay, that's interesting. I, I certainly think that I, I solidified a lot of my ideas once I had inpatient and residential programs because then I got to really, I, I think I was able to validate a lot of things that I thought. For example, you know, I always was telling my clients, you, you can eat way more than you think and not gain weight, but I couldn't, it was hard to prove it because they were so afraid even though i i had a successful private practice before i i started running hospitals and stuff but once i had people um actually in a setting where i could do all the things that i thought would promote healing so whether it was um um giving them the certain amount of calories i mean granted that's important and giving them therapy but it was also teaching them meditation um, teaching them yoga and things that, you know, because you're in Marin, we're seen as a California kind of weirdo California residential program, but really doing it and then having the outcomes, the outcomes of Montanito, if you've seen the outcome, the 10 year outcome study, it's pretty astonishing. We have like somewhere in the mid 80% recovery for anorexia and bulimia. And, you know, um, that is that I was surprised myself and with using all of these things now in private practice you you aren't able to have such a good way to tell because you can't is everybody doing it or not but in a center I could see if they were going to the yoga if they were uh, attend you know they would go to the meditation class you know they were getting their calories so I really know that with the right kind of treatment people get better I don't even have a doubt so I would say my, my, um, this, I could get killed for this, you know, not killed, but people would be upset if I said this. Um, there are things I've learned about certain medications, about the science that backs up what I do, but my fundamental belief in how people heal and the treatment is the same. My director of operations for the Carolyn Costin Institute was telling me she listened to some tapes while I was gone because we're using them for training purposes. And she said, oh, there's this great family session you did. And I said, you know what? I did that family session 28 years ago. And it's the same as I would do today because there are fundamentals mm -hmm. that I just think are, are, are not going to change. But I do think I can explain them better. 
I can get them across better. I can teach them to other people because I don't have to guess because I can get the science to back it up. And that that's important that we have these studies and we have these people who like to do research so they can say, it's just like acupuncture. Western medicine didn't accept acupuncture until the Western scientists did all the studies and found out, oh yeah, there are these meridian points and then we could accept it. You know what I mean? I, I really do know what you mean. Um, yes, and uh, I'm trying to contain my excitement and to stay <laughs> on focus here because I could go off in so many different directions. I know, I know. Love everything you're saying. Well, I'm probably going off too. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'm going to try and focus us again, but I, I love um, all the directions that you're, that you're really going in. <laughs> and, I, and I did, okay, just go off a little bit again, just to say that um, one of the things that I've noticed in my, in my own effectiveness as a therapist is that the more grounded I am, the more I've dealt with my own issues and worked on myself, the more I'm a healing presence in the room. And I think that's, right? That's the evolution so I see okay. what you're saying. It's like there's, there's some basics, but where are there's they? There's a great. There's a great study about that by a uh, 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 great mare. Have you heard of the great mare study? No, I haven't. Well, it's G R E P M A I R, and if you forget that, um, just send me an email and I'll send it to you. It's a really great study where they divided the group um, of uh, patients in a hospital, and they had the. Uh, therapists meditate before they went in and did their therapy during the day and they had the ones that didn't and the therapist who and it was a double blind placebo controlled so they didn't know I mean I don't know if I said that right uh, uh, well at least the patients didn't I may have said that wrong but the patients didn't know which therapists were meditating right anyway at the end um, there's all kinds of things that the patients who were seen by meditating therapists did so much better on. And so the question is, why is that? Why is that? I don't think therapists have to meditate. I mean, I, um, I, I find that actually difficult. Uh, doing breathing practices or yoga is easier for me. Um, but, um, but I do think our presence makes a big difference and our comfortability with ourself, our own nervous system and what messages that gives off, you know? our own uh, window of tolerance for different affect and, and all that makes a big difference in our ability to help someone else heal. Very well said. So, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a pivot and I want to talk about your talk because um, your title is Neuroscience, Quantum Physics, Spirituality, and Eating Disorders. So that's a, <laughs> what were you thinking? It's a really I order. I, I so, really, you know, to, yeah. no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I wanted um, you to really tell us, um, you know, what the connections are that you see. I mean, you've alluded to that and some of the other answers that you've given, but the connection with eating disorders and treatment is just uh, fascinating. Um, yeah, the reason that I want to do it is because I, I like to, not all the time, sometimes I talk about very, um, maybe a little bit more practical issues. Although in this talk, I will, I will give practical things. I don't do talks that just are theoretical. So there will be take home things for, for clinicians to say, I can go and actually do this in my practice. But um, I really wanted to talk about this healing that doesn't get um, talked about, that gets left out when we, maybe it was my reaction to um, the, all the evidence-based treatment stuff. Um, evidence-based treatment stuff, in, in my opinion, was getting shoved down people in yep. a way like CBT and FBT and all these things. You know, I have this funny saying, you know, CBT, FBT, IPT, EFT, you know, or, or a cup of tea. <laughs> right? Because sometimes, because there is this other, whoever is doing those evidence-based treatment, who that person is makes a big difference. Yes. So, and also I, there's so many things to say. I don't want to be too, go too far off on that. But, but I wanted to talk about this part of treatment that is a little more difficult. The art of therapy versus the science. But I also 
in looking at neuroscience, I wanted to give it a basis. I, and, and looking at quantum physics, I wanted to say, I want to help clinicians see we are learning things in, in, in quantum physics and neuroscience now that unless you were really into it and studying it, you wouldn't know. And they are backing up the things that we in our gut um, believed and felt like um, the, the presence of the therapist, like, um, my, like breathing exercises, like mindfulness practices that help strengthen the prefrontal cortex and help calm the amygdala, which it turns out it looks like, it's not definitive proof, but it looks like the amygdala is in hyperarousal in anorexia, just like it is in anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. So if we have techniques that can help calm that, that we know work, mm -hmm. Yes, they used to be thought of as spiritual, like meditation, but there's neuroscience to back it up. The quantum physics is a little harder, um, but there are things that we're learning about quantum physics, about, like I said, the nature of reality, what we pay attention to, the connection. What I, the main thing that I think the quantum physics piece does is help explain to to someone who's suffering, you are not um, a separated self like you think you are. You, you are connected in a way that, that you, you're not in touch with. And, and it's exciting for them. I think it's motivating for them to get in touch with that piece of themselves, which you could call whatever, spirit or soul or whatever. It doesn't have to be religious at all, mm -hmm. at all. It just means that I am more than a separate individual self. You transcend, which is a, really, a spiritual concept. You transcend the individual self. And that's what gets so caught up in people who have eating disorders, this individual I. I weigh this much. I'm fat. I'm worthy. I'm not worthy. And they get confused. Their ego mind, which is important, is confused with their, that inner essence. And, they, they, and I don't think they're even being taught that. So... That, when you look at what quantum physics says, it's the same thing as what ancient spiritual texts have said about it, which I think is just fascinating. It, it, it truly is. And I, um, you, you know, maybe you can help me with the uh, specifics of the science, but I remember when I was doing a lot of reading in quantum physics, I was fascinated with the um, evidence that just by the nature of being observed, molecules were we're changing. And so it speaks to mindfulness. And when you bring presence and you observe what you're doing, you're already creating a change. Right. Well, yeah, that's the double slit experiment with the, light, the photons. So it's not yeah. molecules, it's mo smaller matter than that, but it, it, on a quantum level, which can't really be seen, they, they can be measured, but you're absolutely right. The way dependent, if the, if the scientists were, were looking for particles, they discovered particles. If they were looking in a different way, they were waves. How can something be a particle and a wave at the same time? And it caused this flurry, you know, of things. But that was a huge step back for anyone who read it, like obviously you and I did. We went, whoa, okay, this means something. We affect, we have an effect based on how, how, what, where our energy is in the looking, in the observation. And then there's a lot of people who thought about that and wrote about that. And, um, but they're not, it's not being taught to, um, it's, it's not being taught to clients for sure. And it's not being taught to people like us unless we go looking for it. I mean, the thing that we learned, we learned Newtonian, Newtonian physics. We didn't learn about this. So unless Human beings are keeping up with this science stuff, which, by the way, you know, is kind of hard stuff to read. Um, people don't know. So I thought one of the things I'm going to do in the talk is going to show an old model of what we thought atoms looked like, you know, that looked like the universe. Here's the nucleus and here's the photons and uh, protons and electrons, you know, going around it. And, and, and that's an old model. That doesn't even exist. But but. A lot of people still think that because, yeah, I mean, unless you have some reason to be looking at the new quantum physics articles, um, you wouldn't know that. Yes. Um, I, I just wanted to also reference back to something you said about the art and the science of, of what we do. And 
you know, you were talking about all this CBT and ABC, and I, I just call it alphabet soup. And, and when, I, when I look at the actual um, theory and practice, I always think, well, that's a lot of it is basic psychotherapy that's being put into a formula. That's and true. that if you're right, you're present in the room, that you're, you're going to use those tools as necessary, but not necessarily, you know, step one, step two. So I'm really glad to hear you acknowledge that. And I don't know if you know, we have rebranded our conference. So for the first time this year, it's the art and science. It's advancing the art and science of psychotherapy. And I that's know. really, right? I'm very excited I know. about that. I saw that. I got the thing in the mail when I got back from my trip and I saw that and I went, oh, that's so perfect for my talk, you know? Yes, so I'm, I'm very because excited about that. The art has to come in there. If it were just some kind of rote, you, uh, what I said to some people in the, in the CBT and the FBT world, and, and granted, they, they, they've added to, to the, the dialogue. They brought some good research and evidence. I think they have helped some, like in the eating disorder world, for example, the CBT world has helped some therapists to not just be stuck on the psychodynamic piece and to actually get into it with, what did you eat today? You know, that's really nice, but um, enough talk about your mother. What'd you eat? You know, the CBT was really about, you have to deal with the behaviors. You have to deal with the thoughts affecting the behaviors rather than just, you know, their relationship with their mother kind of thing. I know that's simplistic, but you know what I mean? I, I don't want to say they haven't contributed. But honestly, the, the way you have to do CBT, the way it's promoted by doing it manualized, by doing it because that's the only thing that has evidence. Well, that's just because you can't do a study unless you have the manual because everybody has to do it the same or the study doesn't mean anything, you know? Right. I was very heartened. I was at a talk at uh, UCSF. It was um, through the psychiatry department. And there was an, an audience, an auditorium full of psychiatrists and medical students that were acknowledging this very thing. And they were talking about the art of psychotherapy and that we're getting so weighed down by evidence base that we're taking the humanity out of it and the relational aspect of it. And so, yes, you're right. There are great contributions and these are like tools in a, in a toolbox, but they have to be woven into um, your, your presence in the room with your patient. And that's, you know, that's right. how people feel seen and, and responded to. Right. So I, I don't know if there was anything else you wanted to add about quantum physics before we <laughs> shift, because I had another question about your talk. No, no go ahead. I, if I do, I'll come back to it. Okay, so, you know, we have people that come to the conference. Some of them are, are trainees still in school. Some are associates that are working on their hours. And some are very seasoned therapists. And so I wanted to ask you about um, it, it, your talk and whether it's targeted to a certain group and, and if someone is really new, what they might take away from this talk. And for someone who's very seasoned, what, what would the takeaway be for them? Well, I, I feel like it's appropriate for all levels because it, it, it's concepts and how to put these concepts into practice. And I don't think you have to be an experienced clinician for that at all. I only think if, if someone is coming to, if someone were to come to the talk thinking they were going to learn eating disorder 101, like assessment and all that, I don't think the talk will, will make them think, the title will make them think that, right? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think they'll think that from the title. I, I think that, um, I think what it might do for experienced clinicians is give them uh, some things to back up what they it, believe in their gut. That's what I hear from a lot of people. I believe that I want to do that, but but now you've given me some evidence, uh, so I can use it when people are saying, "Why are you doing that?" You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, for for new clinicians, I think it might make them a little more excited about um, tools that they have for going into this field or, or for working with this kind of population. But I I think I told you when we first started talking, that I, I, I do feel like these tools can be used um, across the board. They're not just limited for eating disorders. My and when I looked at the, at the brochure today, I thought, you know, it's just that's what I am. I'm an eating disorder therapist and have been forever, and it's probably appropriate. But I almost wanted eating disorders out of it because I thought, I hope people will go realizing that this is applicable to other populations. 
Well, if they listen to this interview, this is your chance to really help them understand that. Do you want to say a little more about that? Well, because like uh, we were talking about earlier, the, the everything that's talked about is really applied to the underlying healing. And the underlying healing, whether whether the problem the person has is using drugs or using food or you know restricting from food or um, self-harming or alcohol or gambling or sex, whatever it is, that this talk really is about how you connect with and heal the underlying part that causes somebody to reach out to those kinds of things. So that's why I feel like anyone who's working with any other population can take the tools and just adapt them for their use with their population. I, I really believe that. People have told me this for a long time about my work, but I've been in the eating disorder field for so long that I tend to just, that's what I do, eating disorder talks. I, I've done a couple substance abuse talks and every time it's been pretty amazing with people saying, my God, I wanna use that same thing. So I, I hope other people will come. Well, that's what I love about the direction our, our, um, you know, our field is really going in because there's this acknowledgement now that you know, whatever the substance or behavior is, that the underlying issues are so similar and so, you know, whether you're sitting in a, in a workshop that's about um, people who are using drugs or alcohol or any of these behaviors that you mentioned, or food as a substance, or, or not eating as a way of, you know, controlling um, different states of being, that un the underlying issues are the same. So um, I, I agree with you that it's going, it would be relevant for people who don't necessarily specialize in eating disorders and sometimes don't realize because they haven't asked the question that the people that, um, that they're treating are actually struggling with food and struggling with their relationship with their body. But you well, know, this, is a good, this is a very good point. Uh, the chemical dependency treatment centers that I, I've consulted with a lot of them. And one of the things that they realize is like, for example, they'll get people, amphetamine users, cocaine users, meth users, and they're, they're treating their addiction. But underneath that addiction is an eating disorder. And the person is taking those drugs because they have an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And that then was, if that's not addressed, it doesn't matter how many 12-step meetings they go to. Well, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. But you know what I mean? They, and then underneath the eating disorder is the other level of why they have that. So we have to get down in the layers. And sometimes specialization is good. But sometimes over-specialization creates the same kind of thing that I see sometimes with my doctors. I had an illness recently, and it was a very, very, very particular thing. But what happened was I had all these specialists looking at each piece of it, right? Mm -hmm. This one, the pituitary specialist, this endocrinologist specialist, this adrenal specialist. But... I was like, where's my conductor of the orchestra? Where's the person that can look at my whole system and, and look at the whole being, you know? Specialization is good, but sometimes we lose the, the can't see the forest for the trees because of it. Yes, very, very well said. And um, one of my first jobs was at a methadone treatment center. That was when I, when I was working on my hours. And um, what we saw often was that, you know, eating disorders emerged. And when you got a history from a patient, they, that was really their first kind of addiction or substance use. And then they added on and added on. And so it was like uncovering and going backwards. And then, as you said, getting underneath to why they were turning to food at such an early age. You know, when, if you go to 12-step meetings, you'll, you'll see that back table loaded with, you know, uh, coffee and all kinds of sweets because people are focused on sugar. I know. And they're smoking. Lots of smoking. You know, it is, it is really interesting. Yeah. It's, that's, that's, that's really true. I want to thank you so much. This has been fun and just very validating for me as a, as a therapist. And I know other therapists are going to feel this way and just happy to um, help get out the word about. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Really. Thank you. I feel so appreciative. You, you had me do this. Yeah. Thank you very much. And we'll be seeing you soon. End of April. Yeah. Yep.